Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today, we're going to explore the higher level content for topic 4.3, Aquatic Food Production Systems. We'll examine how water environments support life and provide food for human societies. We're going to look at the science behind ocean productivity, the challenges of managing fish populations sustainably, and the complex ethical questions surrounding our use of marine resources. So let's get into it. In aquatic ecosystems, as in all ecosystems, everything is connected to everything else. Productivity, the amount of life that water can support, depends on several key factors working together. Thermal stratification occurs when warm water sits on top of cold water, and that creates layers that don't mix easily. This layering affects how nutrients move through the water column. Nutrient mixing brings essential elements like nitrogen and phosphorus to the surface where phytoplankton can use them. Nutrient loading refers to how much of these vital nutrients enter the system from sources like rivers or human activities. When these processes work together effectively, they create highly productive marine environments that can support large fish populations and ultimately human food systems. This global map shows us where marine life is most abundant by measuring chlorophyll concentrations. Chlorophyll indicates the presence of phytoplankton, the tiny plants that form the base of ocean food webs. Notice how the highest concentrations appear near coastlines and in specific ocean regions. Several factors explain this pattern. Coastal areas receive nutrient runoff from land, and that feeds marine plants. Upwelling zones where deep cold water rises to the surface bring nutrients from the ocean depths. These nutrients have accumulated from decomposing organisms that sank to the seafloor. The contrast between the deep blue ocean centers and the green coastal areas shows where fishing might be most productive and where conservation efforts are most important. Ocean productivity follows clear geographical patterns. The most productive waters occur near coastlines and in shallow seas where upwelling and nutrient enrichment create ideal conditions for marine life. This productivity map shows why most of the world's major fisheries are located in these zones. From an environmental economics perspective, these highly productive areas represent our most valuable marine resources. They support not only commercial fishing industries, but also the livelihoods of coastal communities around the world. However, this concentration of productivity also creates economic pressure that can lead to over-exploitation. Understanding these patterns helps us make better decisions about where to establish marine protected areas and how to manage fishing quotas sustainably. Accurate assessment of fish stocks requires complete and thorough data collection. Scientists need three types of information to manage fisheries responsibly. This scientific approach reflects environmental law principles that require evidence-based decision-making for natural resource management. Fish stock assessments combine multiple data sources to create a complete picture of fish population health. This systematic approach ensures that fishing regulations are based on solid scientific evidence rather than guesswork or short-term economic interests. Effective fisheries management depends on collecting three types of data. Catch data tells us how many fish are being removed from the ocean through dockside monitoring, fishing log books, and onboard observers. This information helps track fishing pressure on different species. Abundance data measures how many fish actually exist in the water through scientific surveys and research vessel studies. Biology data examines how fish grow, how they reproduce, and how they move through their environment. Scientists study fish ear bones, which grow in rings like tree trunks, to determine their age and their growth rates. This comprehensive approach reflects environmental law requirements for sustainable resource management. Many international agreements require countries to use scientific assessments when setting fishing limits, and that ensures that economic activities don't exceed environmental limits. Modern technology enhances our ability to monitor fishing activities. Electronic monitoring systems track the number and the mass of fish caught, measuring fishing effort and they document bycatch, which is the unintended capture of non-target species. This technology serves both economic and environmental purposes. It provides more accurate data for stock assessments while helping fishing operations become more efficient and more sustainable. From an environmental law perspective, electronic monitoring can help enforce fishing regulations 
and it can ensure compliance with international agreements. It also supports environmental ethics by promoting transparency in how we use marine resources. Maximum sustainable yield represents the theoretical highest catch that can be maintained over time. However, fishing at MSY levels involves significant risks that require really careful management. The concept of maximum sustainable yield reflects environmental economic principles, seeking the maximum economic benefit while maintaining the resource base. However, this approach does have some limitations from both scientific and ethical perspectives. Several factors make estimates of the maximum sustainable yield unreliable and potentially dangerous. First, MSY is only an estimate based on available data, and these estimates can be wrong. Environmental changes like climate shifts or disease outbreaks can pretty dramatically alter fish populations. The approach often ignores differences between ocean regions, and it doesn't account for impacts on non-target species. Most importantly, fishing at the maximum sustainable yield levels reduces fish reproduction capacity. That's the ability of fish to reproduce and replenish the population that was captured. When populations are stressed, they become vulnerable to rapid collapse, and this reflects an environmental ethics challenge. Should we harvest the maximum possible amount, or should we adopt more precautionary approaches that protect marine ecosystems for future generations? The interconnected nature of marine ecosystems means that focusing solely on single species maximum sustainable yield can disrupt entire food webs, and that affects everything from plankton to marine mammals. Species recovery from overexploitation requires cooperation among many different stakeholders. No single group can solve fisheries problems alone. Success depends on collaboration between governments, fishing industries, consumers, and advocacy organizations. This cooperative approach reflects environmental law principles that recognize the shared nature of marine resources. It also demonstrates environmental economics in action, creating incentives for sustainable practices while ensuring economic viability for fishing communities. The North Sea herring fishery provides an excellent example of successful recovery through cooperation. After the population collapsed in the 1970s, many different stakeholders worked together to restore the fishery. Government agencies implemented strict quotas and enforcement, the fishing industry accepted reduced catches, and they adopted selective fishing methods. Scientists provided ongoing stock assessments. Regional organizations coordinated management across national boundaries. And then environmental groups raised public awareness while consumers demanded sustainable products. This recovery of the herring demonstrates that environmental, economic, and social goals can all align when stakeholders are committed to long-term sustainability over short-term profits. The recovery took decades, showing that rebuilding marine ecosystems requires patience and sustained commitment. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea establishes important legal frameworks for marine resource management. Coastal states control exclusive economic zones, or EEZs, that extend 370 kilometers from their shores. These EEZs give them authority to regulate fishing within these areas. However, almost 60% of the ocean lies in international waters with limited governance. That creates challenges for managing migratory species and for addressing global environmental problems like overfishing and pollution. The exclusive economic zones represent a compromise between national sovereignty and international cooperation in ocean management. These boundaries give coastal nations economic rights while maintaining principles of freedom of navigation. From an environmental law perspective, EEZs create opportunities for effective management, but they also create challenges. Fish don't respect political boundaries, so managing migratory species requires international cooperation. The system also creates potential for conflicts when nations disagree about boundary locations or fishing rights. The technical details of marine boundaries reveal the complexity of ocean governance. EEZ boundaries are measured from baseline points along the coast, typically the mean low water mark. This technical approach makes sure that there are consistency in applying international law. However, the legal frameworks have to address real-world complexities like irregular coastlines, islands, and disputed territories. The measurement system reflects environmental law principles that seek to balance national interests with international cooperation. Ocean governance raises important questions about equity and justice. 
When countries sell fishing access rights to foreign fleets rather than managing resources for local communities, it can create social and economic problems for coastal populations who depend on marine resources for their livelihoods. The UN has developed international treaties to protect the high seas, but implementation is still challenging. The South China Sea disputes illustrate how conflicting territorial claims can complicate resource management and potentially lead to conflicts. These situations reflect environmental ethics questions about who has the right to use marine resources and how those benefits should be distributed fairly. Harvesting of seals, whales, dolphins, and other marine animals raises complex ethical issues that involve both animal rights and indigenous human rights. These situations require us to balance different moral perspectives and cultural values. Environmental ethics frameworks helps us think through these challenging questions by considering different viewpoints and different values. Narwhal hunting by Inuit communities illustrates the complexity of marine mammal ethics. These Arctic whales provide essential nutrition and income for indigenous communities who've hunted them sustainably for centuries. However, narwhal populations are declining rapidly, with some estimates suggesting there's only about 400 of them left in Greenland. This situation raises environmental ethics questions about subsistence rights, cultural preservation, and species conservation. How do you balance indigenous rights with conservation needs? Should traditional practices continue when species face extinction? Whale hunting presents similar ethical dilemmas. Countries like Japan, Norway, and Iceland, along with various indigenous groups, continue whaling practices that have deep cultural and historical significance. However, whales are highly intelligent mammals with complex social structures, and this raises questions about their treatment. Environmental ethics approaches this issue from multiple angles. Rights-based ethics might focus on the intrinsic rights of intelligent animals. Consequentialist ethics would weigh the benefits and harms of whaling practices. Virtue ethics would ask what character traits we should embody in our relationships with marine life. Dolphin harvesting in places like the Faroe Islands in Japan represents cultural traditions that have been practiced for hundreds of years. However, dolphin meat contains high levels of mercury and toxic compounds, and this raises health concerns alongside ethical questions. These kind of practices challenge us to consider how cultural traditions should adapt to changing environmental conditions and scientific knowledge. Environmental ethics asks whether cultural significance justifies practices that may harm both marine ecosystems and human health. Seal hunting in Canada, Greenland, and Nordic countries provides sustainable livelihoods for coastal communities, but it often involves methods that animal welfare advocates consider inhumane. This situation illustrates the tension between different ethical frameworks. Economic considerations support communities that depend on seal hunting for income. Environmental considerations might support sustainable harvesting of abundant seal populations. And animal welfare ethics focuses on preventing unnecessary suffering. Even harvesting invertebrates like octopi raises ethical questions because scientific research reveals their remarkable intelligence and their problem-solving abilities. Octopi are harvested around the world as an important food source with high nutritional value, but their cognitive abilities challenge traditional assumptions about which animals deserve moral consideration. This expanding understanding of animal intelligence forces us to reconsider our ethical frameworks for marine resource use. Should intelligence be a factor in determining how we treat different species? That's it for the higher level portion of ESS Topic 4.3 Aquatic Food Production Systems. As you can see, harvesting food from aquatic environments involves complex interactions between environmental science, economics, law, and ethics. Understanding productivity patterns helps us identify economically valuable marine resources and design effective conservation strategies. How we assess stock levels provides scientific foundation for sustainable management, while legal and governance frameworks serve as structures for cooperation. However, some of the most challenging aspects of aquatic food systems involve ethical questions about how people relate to marine life and to one another. These ethical questions require us to balance multiple perspectives and values while working towards solutions that protect both marine ecosystems and human communities. Until next time, happy learning.